Excuse me. I praise God for this opportunity to stand before you all with the word of God. Uh, I trust that uh, everybody had a uh, good holiday weekend, and uh, I know some of you all went to the conference. I trust that God took you and brought you back safely. I'm going to uh, jump into the word um, without any more introduction and continue in our series, which we are calling Looking Unto Jesus. Looking Unto Jesus. We've been uh, talking about, uh, if you'll go to the next slide, please, uh, we'll see the outline. We've been talking about uh, the early life. Oh, I guess I can, I can do it myself. Oh, uh, we've been talking about the early life of Christ um, as he uh, transitioned into public ministry. Um, we, I started that, well, ministered started that describing uh, with the baptism of Christ. And then um, I spoke about his wilderness experience. And last uh, time, uh, Jitu, two weeks ago, Jitu spoke about how God has ordained uh, everything in his time. How Christ, when at the right time, uh, he uh, did a different aspect of his, aspects of his ministry. Uh, for today's uh, discussion or meditation, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper on the topic I touched on uh, last time I spoke, which was a month ago, which was about the temptations of Christ. If you'll remember, can you turn these up a little bit? Um, If you'll remember, um, I uh, uh, mentioned uh, the temptation of Christ, but I really focused on uh, the wilderness experience of Christ when I spoke about a month ago. And uh, I was talking about how uh, the experience that we spend in the wilderness as a Christian is crucial to you know, our maturity in Christ and many times and almost always uh, necessary for the anointing that we receive to do ministry just like Christ did before he uh, entered into ministry. But today I want to dive a little deeper into the temptations themselves that Christ faced and uh, kind of dive a little deeper into what those were and what those mean for us. So let's uh, turn to Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Uh, And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan and with the wild beasts and the angels ministered unto him. So this word tempted, if you look at the root word, it's the word parizo, and we've spoken about this before. Um, You know, there's different words that were translated into English that sometimes mean similar things in English, but have a different root word meaning. So in James, he talks about the trying of your faith, which uses a different word called dokimon, that's different than uh, the word parizo used here, which is temptation. And temptation means when some force other than God is trying to do, uh, entice you to do something that you would not do because of what you believe in or who you are. So, uh, many times, of course, the Bible talks about how the devil tempts you into different things. But it also says Jesus was tempted by the Pharisees by asking different questions and trying to trap him, right? Tempt him to uh, leave beside the principles of the word of God. So, temptation is trying to entice you to, when you're enticed to do something uh, that you uh, that is against what you believe in as a person. That's temptation. What I will say is, temptation is something that everybody, everybody, Christian or not, is faced with. If you're not facing temptation, you're 
you're probably oblivious that you're being tempted, that you're ignorant that you're being tempted. Everybody, if Jesus was tempted, so will we be tempted. So it's better if we acknowledge and be vigilant of temptation rather than being oblivious or ignorant. Amen. Um, the other thing, I want to just give a quick overview of a couple of things before going into it. One is, one important thing to understand is what the Gospels say about it. So, where you want to read about the temptations of Christ, you can read in Matthew chapter 4, the first 11 verses. You can read about it in Mark. Uh, he just hits, uh, uh, talks about the temptation in two verses, which is the word, two verses we just read. And then Luke talks about the temptation of Christ in chapter 4 as well in the first 13 verses. John, interestingly, does not talk about the temptations of Christ at all. I was very curious why that is, right? So we all know John um, covers things differently than the other three Gospels. Of course, this is not something that, you know, the people have opinions on. It's not something that you can conclusively say. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels, uh, describe in more detail the events that Christ uh, 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 lived out in his life on earth, and uh, while also talking about his parables and teachings and all these other things. Uh, but John focused on the fact that Christ is God. Amen. So one reason people say that he didn't mention the temptations of Christ is that John uh, wrote his book uh, somewhere between 20 and 50 years after the other three Gospels were written, and they were already in circulation. Maybe he felt the need to not have to repeat that again. Okay, so that's one possibility. I think that's less likely. The other reason people say that John didn't write about the temptations of Christ is that he um, was singularly focused on the aspect of Christ being God. And because that was his focus, maybe he thought that talking about the temptation of God is detracting from his divine nature. Not that he didn't face the temptations, but he chose to merely not highlight it. And especially since there were three accounts of the temptation of Christ, it was not that, uh, you know, it would be missed. He probably thought it was not necessary to highlight it because maybe there's risk of detracting from his divine nature. As James says, God is not tempted of evil. So if the Jews were to accept Christ as God, maybe if I'm making a case that Christ is God, going into the fact that he was tempted by the devil may take away from that message. So again, more opinions than simply stated in the Bible. So I thought that was a good reason. I just wanted to share that with you. So, you all with me? Yes? Okay. All right. So now going a little bit more into the temptations themselves. Uh, we all know and talk about it a lot. Um, there were three temptations of Christ. Uh, as you can see from the map, uh, just real quick, after his baptism, um, he was immediately led by the Spirit into this wilderness of Judea. It's a pretty vast area, and that's where he was for 40 days and 40 nights. It says that he did not eat uh, the whole time, but it only says that he was hungry after that time was finished. So perhaps God empowered uh, or the Spirit of God strengthened him that he did not realize or was, was not weakened by hunger. But we know that he was hungry because it says that in Matthew and in Luke, uh, showing the human nature of Christ on earth, right? That he put aside his divine nature to become a human being, and he was also subject to hunger just like as we are, Right? So the question could arise, could he have succumbed to temptation, right? How did he resist temptation 
when Adam did not, right? I believe that Christ used the power of the Spirit and obedience to the power of the Spirit to resist temptation, as we'll talk about in a bit. So it's not he used his super power of being a God or his divine nature to resist the devil, but showed us an example of how to resist temptation through the power of the word of God. You all with me? In fact, you could even look at the temptations themselves and say the devil was tempting him to put aside the human nature that he took on and show people or to show the devil that you are God. Turn these stones into bread if you're the son of God. Show, prove it to me. Show me that you are God by doing this miracle right in front of me. So in fact, I believe he was being tempted to, uh, to uh, go stray away from the purpose that he was on earth for, which is to subject himself into as a human being. So I believe it was the power of the Spirit and the work of the Word of God that was working through Christ that resisted the devil in those temptations. Okay, now just a quick overview of the three temptations that he faced. First one was, and uh, just real, you know, just a note for, for your knowledge, if you haven't seen it already. Uh, Matthew and uh, Luke uh, goes into the three temptations. Uh, Matthew, both of them talk about the uh, turning stone into bread as the first temptation, but they switch the order on the second one. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, so the first one was, uh, the devil said, if, if you, I mean, he's saying you're fasting, you must be hungry. Why don't you, if, you're, if you call yourself God, why don't you make these stones and make them bread and feed yourself? Why are you putting up with this hunger when you could easily do that? Right? That's when Jesus resisted him with the word that said, What? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This is a reference to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, where Moses was telling the Israelites about um, how God led them through the wilderness and to Prove what was in your heart. And he tempted the Israelites with different things in the wilderness to show the real nature of their heart. And then he says, you cannot live by the bread, uh, the bread that you see, the substance that you have in this world, but the word of God should be the, what powers you and causes you to make decisions every day of your life. Amen? So that's what Jesus is saying to the devil. Yeah, no, I'm not going to get out of this situation uh, just because I can uh, uh, as God. I'm going to endure this fasting. I'm going to finish what I started. I'm going to not look for a shortcut. I'm going to trust in God and the word of God rather than trying to find an easy way out. I will, in fact, say a lot of the false teachings uh, are, bear, you know, in the same spirit, right? Uh, if you will, the prosperity gospel is what? Find an easy way out. You don't have enough faith. That's why you don't have these things that you want. Why don't you just cause God to come down and turn these stones into a job, into a car, or, or pay off your debt? Why don't you just summon the powers of God to change your situation? That's the nature of the prosperity gospel. This is what we're tempted with regularly. Is use the power of God to your advantage. So you can quickly get out of whatever trial you're going through. We must also resist those temptations just like, the, like Jesus did. I want to keep going. The second temptation was the devil in a moment. And I believe this was maybe a vision or a trance. Um, I don't know that he took him physically around the world. Maybe it's possible. Uh, but it says that in a moment, the devil took Jesus 
around the world and showed all the kingdoms of the world and the glory and the power of the world. And he said, if you will fall down and worship me, I will give you this. This has been given in my hand. And Jesus immediately rebuked him and said, get behind me, Satan, only the Lord your God you should worship. Only him you should serve. Again, this is a reference to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. He used the word of God to de- resist the temptation that he was facing. Amen? We are also many times faced with this choice to choose the ways of the world or the ways uh, tempted to choose uh, shortcuts that might give us power or glory or position, whether in the church or in the secular world. And we are asked to, uh, often tempted to choose those ways uh, so that we may get those things. We must follow the example of Christ and say, no, I will only worship God. I don't care what I give up. I don't care how long it takes. I know that if God has meant something from me, it'll come to pass at the right time. As Justin said last time in First Peter chapter 5, it says, cast all your cares upon him. Yes, you have desires. We all have desires and ambitions and things we want to achieve. But don't succumb to the enticement of the devil to choose the shortcut. But cast your cares upon him and he will exalt you in due time. In due time, he will exalt you. Resist the temptation of the devil using the word of God that is in your heart. Amen. So uh, the last temptation was an interesting one. Um, let's read uh, verse uh, Luke chapter four, verse nine, uh, nine through uh, twelve. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence, for it is written. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up. Lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So the devil took him to, again it could be a vision or physically took him. It doesn't say. Um, but he took him to the high highest part of the temple and some say that could be you know 10 stories high in uh, modern world so you know if you jump off of that you're going to die right more than broken bones you're probably going to die from that height so again he is trying to tempt him this one is a little bit different than the first one he's not saying use your uh, powers as God to um Uh, to you know just fly down but he's saying use your position as God to or even if you're the son of God or son of man use that position of authority and command these angels to come just scoop you up because that's what God promised didn't God say in Psalm 91 that what his angels will be over charge over you will not stumble upon a rock right we quote that psalm all the time so why not do that and prove yourself that you are the son of god again he's been asked to prove that he is god but we know he is god through what he did later in his life right we know him by his words we know him by the miracles that he did we don't need to him to prove he is god by succumbing to temptation the same way Many times we're faced with this choice. Oh, first of all, I don't believe that when Jesus said, you should not tempt the Lord your God, I don't think he was saying, stop these temptations right now. Like he wasn't talking about the three temptations he was facing. Right? He willingly went through those. Right? The Spirit led him to ta- face those temptations. So God is going to lead you to places where you are tempted. Okay? That's not what Jesus is saying. He is saying... 
you should not test god through the actions the choices that you make just because god's protection is in your life you should not use that as a way to test him to see what god will do we saw a lot of this and again i'm not you know there was a lot of uh, unreasonable things happening during covid right uh but some people chose to live as if there was no virus out there like oh faith over fear i'm going to do what whatever i i want and not not choose to follow common sense or to mind what other people felt about the situation if you're going through a sickness yeah you should take the precautions necessary to get better right not to test god and that he will just jump to your defense just because of foolish decisions that you made amen yes i believe in faith i trust in god for my healing i trust in god that whenever i come to him when i have need he'll be there there's a difference between that and literally jumping off a tall building and saying god protect me amen don't do foolish things in the name of faith and expect god will just save you out of those things amen the things you're accountable for you are accountable for amen yes god helps you but whether it comes to your work you can just ignore your duties as the place of work you have and just say god just jump to my defense no you have to be diligent in wherever god placed you in school you can't just you know uh, ignore your studies and expect god to jump to your defense every time don't test god amen the things we're supposed to do on this world in this world we have a responsibility to do those things amen we can't just say oh i live by faith um and so oops um um we have to be intentional about how we live our life you all with me okay i want to keep going faster now um, uh just one more point about this whole thing why did jesus go through temptation what was the purpose i want to say two points about it before moving on one is he was here to reverse the curse of adam make a way for man so adam and eve disobeyed and succumbed to the de- uh, temptation of the devil but hebrews chapter 2 says the captain of our salvation was made perfect through suffering in that he obeyed amen jesus reversed the curse of adam through his obedience jesus obeyed when adam disobeyed through his obedience he made a way for us to receive salvation amen otherwise we were all under the curse because we all continued to disobey and through his obedience he reversed the curse of adam amen and made a way the second thing is in hebrews chapter 2 as well chapter 2 verse um 17 and 18 wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to god to make reconciliation for the sins of the people for in that he himself has suffered being tempted he is able to succor or help them that are tempted i believe that jesus went through temptation because he can be our brother he can know because he is the high priest we can go to him when we're tempted we can find help in the time of need and he knows and understands what we're going through because he experienced it himself okay and i'm going to talk about samson and delilah at uh, samson later in a couple of minutes but you know it's not like delilah just tempted him just one time right and left him alone she just over tried to overpower him constantly nagging him and tried to cause him to reveal the source of his strength the same way it's not like the devil just showed up as a gentleman 
and presented these questions to the devil, uh, to Jesus. No, he was tempted of him the 40 days. He was there in his ear tempting him the whole time. I believe these three questions are a summary of the, the three tri temptations that he faced. But it says that he tempted him for 40 days. He went through the same things that we go through. He went through the choices that we are faced with. So he can understand what it is like to be when we're faced with temptation. He overcame it so we can overcome it, not because we are, uh, you know, just like Jesus could have called angels and all this. We're not trying to overcome temptation through the powers of our own strength. We're trying to overcome temptation through the same word that Jesus believed in, through the same spirit that Jesus was strengthened by. That is how we overcome temptation. Not to be oblivious or ignorant to temptation, but rather when we're faced with choices, we choose to trust in God every single time. Amen? You all with me? So Jesus was a high priest and he endured temptation so that he understands what we are faced with when we're faced with these choices. Amen? Uh, next point real quick. I have way past my time, so I want to cover these real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 um, talks about um, the example of Israel, how they were in the wilderness and they tested God, they gave in to idolatry and sexual immorality, and God was not pleased with them at all. And that's why it says in verses, verse 9 of chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Don't test Christ. Don't give in to temptation. But the thing we have to remember is, I was trying to find, oh, verse 12, Wherefore let him think that he stands, take heed, lest he fall. We hear of so many prominent preachers succumbing or falling to sin and have to step away from their ministry. That should not be surprising to us. They are also human beings like us. And perhaps they gave into temptation given the circumstance they were in. So, but the problem happens when we think we're above temptation. When we think that we're better than temptation. We're all faced with these choices on a daily basis. Every day, just like I showed the map on, on, the, on the screen here, every day, you know, it's like when you put an address in Google, Google Maps, it gives you a choice, right? You can take the shortest path, or if you go this way, it's another, you know, 10 minutes, or if you go another way, it's another five minutes. You all, you, when you choose the easy way out, when, when we, we succumb to temptation when we choose the easy way out. When we choose to follow what seems convenient and not the path of Christ, right? That's when we stray away and start falling away. So take heed that you, if you think you stand, take heed. Be careful lest you fall because you are standing on Christ. Amen? So when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, or I am the door, he was literally saying he himself, through him, not just merely his words, but he himself is the way and the door. It is through the paths that he went that we have to go through as well. Amen? So when I say that, what I mean by that is, this might seem counterintuitive, but... Temptations actually transform us. Sometimes we make the wrong choices. We fail many times. I fail many times, daily basis. We should make the right choice and we look back, why did we do that? We were tempted, now it looks so clear, I shouldn't have done that. Right? But when we come back, when we choose to trust in God and ask Him to bring you back and through repentance are transformed daily. God is doing a work in us. This is what happened in the wilderness. The Israel that left Egypt, they had to be transformed. Only Joshua and Caleb and the new generation made into Israel. That talks about the old man. 
They were transformed in their temptation. Only Joshua and Caleb transformed from the old man into the new man and made it into the promised land. That transformation happened in the wilderness. It's no coincidence that Jesus was also tempted for 40 days, representing the 40 years that Israel was tempted. Jesus was victorious where Israel failed. Joshua and Caleb are the shadow of the, our transformation that happens through temptation. When we make choices through the word of God, he transforms us. We fail many times, but we get back up and know that our trust is only in Christ. Amen? I mean, it's so important to understand. You also have to understand, uh, it's not like he, Jesus just memorized scripture and was just regurgitating back at him, right? Sometimes, again, going back to COVID, you know, we would just, you know, just recite Psalm 91. We just kind of regurgitate Psalm 91, hoping that it does something. We're not like uh, pagans, just chanting words, uh, you know, that uh, when convenient. No, Jesus believed in those words that he lived by them. It, it should, the words that we say should be powered through the belief that we have. And that is not merely just regurgitation and just chanting uh, like, like Gentiles, but rather the, realizing the power that is in the word of God. Last point, <clears throat> uh, just we can learn from Samson. We always think about Samson uh, as an example of failure. But he's just like us. Like I said, we all fail and we succumb to temptation. He had the strength to do many powerful things. What happened was he for a moment forgot the power of his strength. And that's what Delilah was trying to get. You know, she was trying to throw, throw her off the tracks. And then finally, he revealed the power and the source of his strength, which was in the vow that he made, the hair that he had, the vow. This covenant that we have with Christ, this relationship that we have with Christ that comes from abiding in him, in his word, that is the power and source of our strength. That's what allows us to overcome temptation. Amen. When Samson realized that and returned to that at the end of his day, he was able to kill more Philistines than all his life because he realized the source of his strength was from God, that relationship he had with God. So may we remember that when we are faced with temptations as well, when we face trials as well, and we are faced with choices that are difficult, may we return to the source of our strength, which is in Christ. May his name be glorified.